Good morning, everyone. My name is Mike Light. I'm the chair of the social science department, and it's my uh, pleasure to be able to introduce our guest speaker this morning. I want to talk for just a couple minutes about our race, ethnicity, and identity conference that we host every year. Um, this has been a two-week long event, so we're on day two of week two. And uh, you're in for a treat this morning, by the way. This is the one I would have picked if I could pick one. Um, Later on this afternoon, in this very room, there are a couple other uh, events that I wanted to um, plug for a minute, if you'll allow me. From 3 to 5.30 p.m., there's a film showing and a panel discussion on the film entitled The Last Innocent Year, America in 1964. That should be pretty interesting. There's a panel that includes uh, historians, anthropologists, um, economists, uh, talking about that pivotal year in American history. It'll be, it'll be really interesting. From 6.30 to 8, Dr. Carolyn Faria will be talking about fear and desire and the South Sudanese beauty trade. So we've had sort of an African theme running through uh, many of our presentations for these last two weeks, and that will continue this evening. So hopefully you can make some of those events as well. Um, this morning, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing a longtime colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Robert Hendershot. Uh, Dr. Hendershot holds uh, an MA, a BA from Michigan State University, an MA from Central Michigan University, and a PhD from Central Michigan University, which included uh, some study abroad in Glasgow as well. He's the author of uh, numerous articles and uh, a book that uh, I think is uh, one of the best I've ever read on the Anglo-American special relationship. It's called Family Spats. Perception, Illusion, and Sentimentality in the Anglo-American Special Relationship. It was published in 2008. Dr. Hendershot is um, a great academic, so you're going to learn a lot about India in depth from someone who's an expert and somebody who knows what they're talking about. Um, he's a fantastic historian, but I think his greatest attribute and the reason that uh, um, I'm so proud to work with him is he's a great teacher and he cares about his students and he cares about the community college mission uh, And I think that's a fantastic thing. So I'm really pleased that we'll be able to hear from him today uh, He'll be talking about nationalism and diverse identities in South Asia uh, He wanted me to tell you that he writes questions for jeopardy in his spare time and he builds brains and all this stuff But I think you'll be wowed by this rather than all that stuff um, So please help me welcome Dr. Hendershot Am I on now? I think so, okay. Well, thank you, Professor Light, for that, that lovely and, and uh, mostly true introduction. Uh, very much appreciated it, and, and, and I'm very pleased to be able to, to participate in our Race and Ethnicity Conference once again this year. And um, once again, to have such a lovely turnout. You know, I mean, I always schedule my, my talks for the conference to line up with at least one of my, my classes, and to this, this time it's my, uh, my 930 modern world history class in the front row here. So I'm glad you all could make it, but then also all the rest of you as well. I recognize some, some faces you know, that I've worked with in the past. You know, Jordan and, and, and AC from other classes uh, are all here. And uh, well, it's a great pleasure to, to see you all again. Uh, I keep seeing more and more faces. Um, so anyway, this is going to kind of box me in. This is set up for our presentation panel this afternoon, but I'll just kind of stick at the podium uh, and move around less. Well, I've been kind of obsessed with this project for the last few days because it's allowed me to relive something that I did last summer, uh, which was spend a considerable amount of time in India. And I've give, I tried to give this a title, and uh, I'd end up taking the sort of shotgun approach to titles with this talk. And it's Nationalism and Diverse Identities in South Asia, Intersections of Caste and Class and Skin Color and Religion and Ethnicity and Language in India. And that's why Indian history is so fascinating to study, because it is such a wonderful examination of cultural uh, and historical diversity and political diversity uh, and gender diversity and, and, and um, ties in very nicely with our conference. But I've had to try to boil it down into, into a workable talk you know, for our hour and a half format. So 
my attempt here, you'll let me know, of course, if it's successful or not. But I have to start, as always, by, by giving thanks where thanks is due. It's only proper to, be, to begin my presentation that way and explaining how it came to be. Last year, I was able to get a grant, a fellowship grant, from the United States National Endowment for the Humanities, or NEH, that allowed me to study in India last summer. I first learned about this here at the college in December of 2012. One of my colleagues sent me an email about the NEH's programs like this. And I thought that it was too perfect, you know, I mean, given my, my interests. I mean, I'd studied, you know, British Empire and I'd studied world history. Uh, and in that context, I had the opportunity to, to learn a lot about India and to read a lot about India and to teach quite a bit about India as well. Uh, and now here was a program designed for historians and art historians and, and other people who taught about India uh, that would take you to India for a month or a little over a month. And you would have unique access to scholars and politicians and journalists and historians and archaeologists and, and, and novelists. And, and, and um, it would be a, a vigorous and rigorous academic program. But I, I, I liked that, that idea. And so I thought I'd take a long shot and apply. It was a very competitive application process. And I should thank uh, my department head, Mike Light, and my dean, Lori Chesley. They wrote me lovely letters of introduction. And lo and behold, I was accepted, uh, along with 23 other academics from across the United States. There were 23 of us total from across the US who were selected to be part of this program. Over 150 people applied. And so I was very humbled right, that, that, I was, that I was chosen to participate. I'd love to travel all my life, but this would be the first time that I was able to go and visit India. I'd studied Indian culture and history for years since grad school. And I'd taught about it, you know, first at GVSU and then at GRCC. But um, yeah, it, uh, this would be a, a whole new level of Indian education. And you know, we started out, we talked about the Indus Valley civilization and the, the, the Indian Bronze Age, and we talked about the classical era. And we studied you know, with religious experts and historians the rise of um, you know, the Vedic traditions and Hinduism and Buddhism and Jainism and uh, so many other of the great religious civilizations that were native to India. But then we also saw and studied the, the arrival of Islam in South Asia and the coming of uh, the British and, and uh, the struggle for independence from the British Empire and the post-independence period. So as I say, you know, it was it was a rigorous thing. The title of the program was called India's Past and the Making of the Present. And the focus was designed to show how memories of the past and perceptions of the past influence people who are alive now. Because of course, the past does not exist without us to perceive it, and without us to attach meaning and value to our concept of history. And that fit in very well with how I teach my own classes. And so I appreciated the structure and, and, and ideology behind this program. I also have to thank the Grand Rapids Community College Foundation because they awarded me a supplemental grant that helped to offset you know, most of my, my travel to and from India. Once I was there, the NEH you know, was providing the fellowship, but GRCC helped me to get there, and I'm grateful for that too. During the program, I was based mostly in Delhi, in New Delhi in particular, but we traveled around quite a bit. You know, we spent time you know, with, our, with our speakers and with our experts, uh, but then we would also travel around the country. And the first thing that I appreciated once I was there on the ground was just how large India is. Uh, it is vastly large. And, and uh, so you spend a lot of time on the road. And you know, as you move from place to place, you, you are drawn to looking out the window and, 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 uh, and watching the world you know, pass by. And it never got old because it was such a different land, uh, such a different culture, different ecosystems. You know, everything was, was fascinating to me. So we did day trips out from Delhi, but we also traveled to other places. We went uh, to Agra, of course. Um, we went to Varanasi, right over on the other side of the Ganges Plain. And I had, the other I had other opportunities to travel you know, outside of the scheduled program, and I went south. I wanted to see parts of southern India 
as well as the north. And so I went south to, I flew to Aurangabad, and there I, I managed to make my way to ancient uh, Buddhist temples, rock cut temples into the sides of mountains at a place called Ajanta. And I also saw Hindu temples and Jain temples at a place called Ellora. And so it was an interesting and diverse program. You know, I got to appreciate the hustle and bustle of big cities in Delhi. Um, and in, in some other big cities as well, it's always it's very busy. I mean, it has a beat to it, and, and it never seems to really stop. I was able to appreciate just splendid beauty at places like Agra. I saw the Taj Mahal, of course. You know, the obligatory visit to the Taj uh, was, was a thrill. And, uh, you know, I was able to go and, and watch the sunrise over the River Ganges. It was a beautiful experience. It was a spiritual experience for many people you know, who, are, who are Hindu. Uh, but I was able to, to, to go and to learn about another culture, another religion, and, and, and to see the validity of their traditions. So I saw countryside. You know, I saw ancient monuments and modern cities. Um, it was a hell of an education. You know, and like I say, I was, I was very humbled by it. I enjoyed a lot of things about that experience. I enjoyed the, the intensity of the scholarship, you know, and I enjoyed meeting new people every day. And I was also tickled because pe people of India seemed to enjoy meeting me. Uh, in fact, I think that I was seen as, as something of an oddity. We traveled around India to many places where a lot of tourists don't go. Um, and I, I felt the sensation that you know, I was a minority, you know, which obviously I was as a foreigner. Um, but even amongst the foreigners in, our, in my group, I was a particular source of attention. And uh, it turned out that people liked to have their photo taken with me. Um, and at first, this was a, a mystery. You know, I, I, I didn't understand why. But then I asked someone else in our, in our group who was from India. And she explained that, well, you're very tall. Uh, and, and you're very, you know, obviously from your, from your clothes and from your, you know, your, the way you move and the way you talk, you're an American. You're an interest. And so they don't want anything from you. They're just curious. And so here it's, it's uh, it Alora. You know, I was just learning about the site and I befriended some people and they wanted to take pictures with me. And uh, so, you know, the, the man there in the, in the green check shirt, you know, he kind of come over and he stood next to me. And then I looked up and said hello, and he said hello. And then he looked over here, and I followed his gaze, and there was this buddy with a cell phone who <laughs> was taking pictures. Uh, and then once I was posing for pictures, then other people wanted to come into the picture too. Um, so it was, it was very nice. It was very, very friendly. You know, they had some English. You know, I had zero Hindi at that point. Um, but we got along great, and, and uh, this was a regular feature of my time in India. Um, you know, frequently, I was popular. You know, I was um, tall. I was told that white people are auspicious. Um, and, and uh, you know, I'm sort of an oddity. But just generally, you know, throughout the entire society, I never had a negative experience. You know, everyone was enormously friendly and courteous. And, and uh, a lot of people wanted to practice their English with a native speaker. Um, so it was, I found it to be a very welcoming culture. And you know, this it makes it easy to make friends when you're exotic. You know, it was a new experience for me. Um, and that continued. But, yeah, I appreciated that. I appreciated the, the, the kindness of people, the openness of people. I really liked the food. I'd always liked Indian food, but like I said, I'd never been to India. And when I got to India, uh, the food was amazing, as you can imagine. And you remember on Sesame Street when the cookie monster used to eat the cookies? Okay, that was me, you know, in Indian food restaurants. I could not get enough of it. Um, but anyway, it was interesting to, to move around, and these are some of my other, you know, shots of different neighborhoods. That's old Delhi, and uh, again, the hustle and bustle of the city. It just, uh, it's an exciting thing just to walk through it, and, and the visual, and and uh, and and, and, and uh, the, the sound, and. And the smell, I mean, all of your senses are very stimulated, you know, when you're there. Um, I enjoyed the feeling of being so far from home. I enjoyed the feeling of being outside of my own comfort zone. They say life begins where your comfort zone ends. And I found that to be true in India. Um, you know, there was just amazing 
um, architecture from every period of, of world history. Um, like I say, traffic was a continuous source of fascination to me. There are so many people, uh, and, and everyone's busy, you know, it seems, and everyone has, has something to do. So traffic was an unending source of fascination. You know, I mean, I was there in monsoon, and so occasionally there'd be a deluge from the sky, and uh, the streets would turn into rivers, and it didn't really slow people down that much. You know, I'm in a bus here, and I took a picture out a window at an intersection. And everybody's still moving, you know what I mean? They're used to it, like we're used to snow here in Michigan. Tuk-tuks were fun. This is like the three-wheeled motorcycle type engine vehicle with a bench in the back. That's how a lot of people get around inside the city. And uh, there's no doors or anything, but uh, you know, it's sort of an exciting way to, to, to get a cheap taxi ride. Of course, there's cows everywhere. Um, Occasionally, traffic has to stop, you know, when uh, they have the right of way. Um, so anyway, it was a very different culture than I was used to. It was a fascinating culture. It was a different climate. Oh my God, it was hot, uh, and uh, you're schwitzing, you know, all the time. Um, you drink a lot of water, you know, to stay to stay healthy. But anyway, it was a very different national experience and. Uh, being far from home, you think about your own nation as much as you think about the nation where you are. I mean, the, it was uh, Marcel Proust's advice was, you know, the, the real voyage of discovery is not in finding new landscapes, but in seeing with new eyes. And, and I think that India helped me with that as well. Um, it was a different nation, and I became, while I was there, very interested in this idea, this concept of the Indian national identity. And that's Indian nationalism it's something that had been interesting to me for a long time as an academic. And I already knew, you know, before I went, that India was a land of vast diversity, but I didn't fully appreciate that until I was there on the ground. Um, but as a historian, you know, studying the creation of nations is a very large part of what we do. And in order to understand the modern period, you have to understand the dynamic of nationalism. And this will no doubt be familiar to, to many of you who've studied history, but when we talk about nationalism, it's an idea that exists in the mind. We can draw borders on paper and call, you know, we draw lines on maps and call them borders. Uh, but this is a very abstract concept. You know, it's not a natural part of, of, the, of, the, of, of the world. You know, we invent nations, we invent borders. As Benedict Anderson, you know, famous historian, famously wrote, nations are imagined communities, like history itself. Without us to perceive them, they do not exist. And the case of Indian nationalism is how I'm going to try to focus my, my time this morning. Nationalism is a powerful sense of belonging. It's a collection of values and attitudes and characteristics that are believed to define all members of the nation. And in this way, nationalism is used, historically, it is used to paper over differences within a society. You know, differences like you know, rich and poor and male and female and old and young and different perceived races. Um, the differences in a society, you can paper over them and say that we're all one because we're all part of the nation. In the USA, for example, you know, we have a, a very powerful sense of nationalism. You can be any of those things that I mentioned. You can be old or young or rich or poor or male or female or black or white uh, and still be American, right? Because the characteristics of the nation define us all. And you know what they are. I mean, there are ideas of nationalism that are out there in the ether of, uh, of the cultural ether of our, of our nation. Baseball, apple pie, Chevrolet, uh, the land of the free, the American dream, the stars and stripes, the melting pot, Lady Liberty in New York Harbor. I mean, all these things define us, right? We, the people, are characterized by these things. This historical experience is us. They define us all because we're all Americans. Our national mythology is very important. You know, it animates our politics and our economics and our, our, our social dynamics. And there are various nationalisms at work in the world. Every nation has their version of a, of a set of national characteristics and a set of identities that define them, or at least are believed to define the people. So other nationalisms work similarly. Often I find that you can, if you can come to understand a community's nationalism or their national identity, you'll, it'll help you to understand the people and places of our world. 
Okay, nationalism is a tool that scholars use to, to dissect the world and to understand how it functions and why it ticks the way it does. So I think it's, maybe it's natural for, for an American abroad in India to wonder when you study India, when you visit India, to wonder to, as you get used to the awe-inspiring diversity of India, you, know, you, you wonder how can there be such a thing as an Indian national identity? It's so large. There's more than a billion people. Right? And there, there's, there's so much diversity. What makes it up, this Indian national identity? How does it, what makes it tick? Right? How does it deal with the lack of a, of a typical Indian, right? or even the, the, the popular mythology of a typical Indian person. There's no such thing as a typical person of India. Um, there's no archetype. Right? There's no sort of standard you know, mythology like we have for in the United States. Perhaps you've heard you know, American politicians on the radio or on television or on the internet, they blather on and on about small town America, about middle America, about average Joes, about Joe six packs, which is I think my favorite Palinism. Uh, Nixon's called it the silent majority. Often it's simply referred to as the heartland. Okay, and this, this mythological America, right, that seems to animate our political discourse. What is that? What, what, what's, what's Joe six pack? You know, what's an average Joe, right? What's small town middle America? Uh, most of these, of course, are euphemisms for you know, middle class white folk. Uh, in particular, white men, uh, Joe six back. Um, but they nevertheless have power in American politics, for good or for better, or worse. Um, and I wondered while I was in India, do, do, do such archetypes exist in, in the Indian conversation? You know, do people talk about you know, your average Indian? Does that exist in perceptions or politics? And of course it didn't. Um, now that was pretty apparent early on. And so I'm wondering how that affects their society. How does that affect their politics? Okay. What the, you know, without that, I mean, what are the components of Indian identity, right? How on earth do they comprise and sustain the concept of the nation of India, the Republic of India, uh, given that it is such a diverse land? Before we can go any further, I think it would be useful to, to do just a little bit of context. So, I'm going to, this is the most ambitious slide in my history with PowerPoint. Uh, it's the history of India in one slide. And this is a, an exercise in futility. This is doomed to failure. But bear with me here. I have a point uh, to this. Okay. Indian civilization can be traced far back you know, in, into the BC period. You know, one of the earliest uh, civilizations anywhere was in the Indus River Valley, which is and symbolic of a lot of the contradictions you know, that we're going to be talking about when it comes to India. Of course, it's from the Indus River where India gets its name. But today, the Indus flows through Pakistan. Okay. Um, well, anyway, this civilization flourished in the dates that you can, you can see here. Uh, that's sort of the, the classic period of the Indus Valley civilization. And it's a marvel to study. You know, and, and, um, the cities were planned. Cities like Harappa and Mohenjo-Daro were vast and, and planned, centrally organized urban centers. The ruins of them are, are still being excavated. And you can see the fascinating technology even in their ruins today. You know, very high quality you know, metallurgy and, and civil engineering. And they have you know, sewers and fresh water and, and, and massive abilities to produce and store surplus. And they had a high standard of living. And very, you know, strangely, in, in the ancient history, they have a very equal housing for the populations. It's a fascinating subject. I was able to see much of their art in the National Museum in Delhi. Um, the dancing girl you know, is what archaeologists call the, the image there on our, our left. Uh, it's about this big, you know, but it's very fine metallurgy. You know, the expression of the face is, is very powerful. Likewise, you know, what they call the great man of Harappa. Again, the image is about, you know, the image is large, but you know, it's actually only about that tall. Uh, but it's very detailed, and you can tell from his cloth it's embroidered. I mean, we're looking at someone of wealth and status. He's got jewelry on his head and on his armband. Um, who was he? Was he a god? Was he a king? Was he an average Joe? We don't know. 
Okay, it's, it's a mystery that waits to be solved. But anyway, the Indus Valley civilization was sort of the heart of South Asia's Bronze Age. Moving on, right, in a future age of India's history called the Vedic Age, because the main primary source that we historians have about this time period are called the Vedas, uh, our religious texts that are very, very old. And they tell us, for example, of, of, a, of, a, of a cultural conflict between two groups labeled in the Vedas as the Aryas, who are newcomers to India, and the Dasas, who were indigenous folk. And it was a, a clash of invader and invaded. And the Vedas also tell us that there was a difference in appearance as well as language and, and culture between the Aryas and the Dasas. Right? The Aryas were, were comparatively lighter skinned and the Dasas were comparatively darker skinned. And pretty much subsequently, skin color matters in Indian society and Indian history. As time goes on, you see that India becomes a, a great crucible, crucible for, for religious innovation. And uh, several of the world's largest religions are, are born in India. You know, one day Hinduism will emerge out of the Vedic faith. Uh, recognizably, modern Hinduism comes a little bit later, but it's an outgrowth of the Vedic age and the Vedas. But then, simultaneously, India is where Buddhism emerges, you know, between the, the 6th and the 4th centuries BCE, according to most estimates. Um, Jainism will emerge in, 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 in India in its ancient period or its classic period. You know, and as a result, India is full of, of you know, passionately designed and constructed religious art. You know, I mean, of all these major faiths, it's inspired so many artists for, for, for millennia. Uh, to express their faith through, through artistic mediums. And so uh, it's a fascinating field for art historians as well. Islam, of course, did not begin in India, but it began uh, in Arabia. But then it spread you know, very quickly after it emerged uh, and started to spread in the 600s. And it spread very quickly through Persia and into India. Uh, the timeline for this, we don't have a clear linear history for the arrival of Islam into India. Um, and it's also important to note that there is not, it's, it's hard to generalize about Islam. You know, I mean, there's not really one Islam. What decade, you know, what region are we talking about? It matters, you know, it's a very diverse religion. But it was spreading certainly into, into India, you know, from the early Middle Ages uh, onward. You know, and by, and, and, uh, by 1192, there's, a, there's an army, right, f armies, right, from, from Gur in Afghanistan who come into India and conquer Delhi and much of the, the, the plain of the river Ganges and, you know, build the, the, a sultanate there called the Delhi Sultanate. But even though it's much of India then is conquered by, you know, sultans, you know, it's still a diverse place. And Islamic rulers in India generally are, are quite tolerant of diversity, you know, historically. For example, the Delhi Sultanate right there, they're going to uh, mint coins. They're going to continue to mint coins in their empires. Uh, but they'll mint them, even though it's for an Islamic empire, with Hindu symbols. Right? On one side of the coin, there's a bull. And if you turn it over, there's the goddess Lakshmi, right? the goddess of wealth and prosperity. And so you know, India has long been a cultural and religious mix. All around India, you'll see you know, glorious ruins. You know, on the right here, you can see uh, the ruins of, of one of the earliest Islamic castles you know, in Delhi. And it is a city unto itself. And you can, it's a park. You can walk through it. Uh, for, it'll take you hours. Uh, but uh, there are concentric layers of fortification and castles you know, to tour. Uh, you can also see you know, in other places the ruins of early uh, mosques you know, and, and great monuments uh, to Islam as you can see there on the left. The most famous Islamic empire to be constructed in India is called the Mughal Empire. And it was built beginning in, in 1526, Common Era. It's India's greatest Islamic empire. And it's famous, of course, for its art and for its architecture. And, and uh, you know, the, the, 
just the beauty of the civilization that it wrought. But you can see, and even this is a, one of the tombs of a great Mughal emperor named Humayun. And you can see, you know, the, the, the buildings are designed to make you lift your eyes up to God. Uh, the buildings appear to float because of the, the intricate use of reflecting pools, uh, like they do at the Taj, where it looks like the building is floating in heaven, right, to represent the, that the person who buried there is now in heaven. You know, it doesn't seem earthly, it seems ethereal. Well, anyway, the Mughal Empire likewise you know, saw you know, more people become Muslims, but rarely by the sword did that ever happen, but rather it was a, a more of a cultural process. And Islam's always going to, you know, has always, has never become the majority in most areas of India. Um, it was a diverse place, and the Mughal Empire, for most of its history, again, respected that, that diversity. It was tolerant of religious diversity. Continuing my leapfrogging through time here. Uh, in 1600, the British East India Company was formulated. That's when they got their charter right, from Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, but in the next century, they'll begin to, to focus more and more on trade with the Mughals and other princes in India. And this becomes a great source of, of trade right, and wealth right, for, the, for the British. And eventually, by the early 1700s, the British are, are a rising power in the world, and they want a monopoly over trade with India. They would start to buy vast amounts of land in India, and they're seizing control of India's economy. And no empire likes that when a foreign corporation starts to seize control of your economy. So of course the Mughals resisted, and other princes in India resisted the encroachment of the British corporation. And then the British corporation, which had private armies of its own, actually the line between British corporation, you know, the East India Company and the British government is quite blurry in many cases. Uh, the line between where the, the, the mercenary armies of the company end and the official armies of the British Empire begin, uh, there's quite a lot of overlap there. So anyway, when the Mughals resisted, the corporation waged war against them, and eventually, you know, they seized control of, of India. And the corporation then ran India from about 1750 to about 1850. Um, change, again, is always in the wind. Right? Change is the only constant thing in life. And the Industrial Revolution will change India's relationship with Britain. As Britain begins to industrialize, you know, say, towards 1800, their thirst for raw materials is unquenchable. Their demand for captive markets for their finished goods uh, is extreme. And they must dominate India to fulfill their concept of their vision for their economy, for their global supremacy. So it becomes, essentially, India becomes too important to Britain, the British Empire, to allow the corporation to run it. And that's punctuated you know, during the first war of Indian independence sometimes called the Sepoy War in, in 1857. Many people in India rose up against foreign domination. They attempted to overthrow uh, the European controllers. And this terrified the British. Okay. I mean, ultimately, you know, this, this war of independence was defeated. Um, the last Mughal emperor was executed, or excuse me, he was not executed. He was sent to Burma. He was exiled. They didn't want to make a martyr out of him. But they executed the last Mughal emperor's children to exterminate the line of the Mughals. And yeah, after, after that, I mean, the thought of losing India in the 1850s was unthinkable. They could not accept it. And so yeah, they replace the East India Corporation. They, they move into a new period of direct crown rule, which in history we call the British Raj. And so the British, through their corporation, are ruling India from essentially the 1750s control of its economy and largely control of the Mughals. Uh, but that becomes an official, right, a, a, a de jure rather than a de facto form of control in 1858. Right, the British Raj is, is begun. And eventually, you know, in the 1870s, they go right ahead and, and uh, they name Queen Victoria. She's not only Queen of England and Ireland and Scotland and, and so on, but she's also the Empress of India. And they give her a separate crown, and a separate coronation. And the monarchs of England are also the emperors and empresses of India. They rule it directly. In India, the British crown would send someone called a viceroy, uh, a governor general, personal representative of the monarch to run India. Well, anyway, under British rule, the British 
suck a lot of resources and wealth out of India. They make it their business. They consider it their, their, their job to do this. Right, under British rule, for example, Bengal, just one region of India called Bengal, uh, suffered 10 famines, each one of them as great or greater than the famous Irish potato famine of the 1840s, okay, as great or greater. The last of these was just recently, it was in World War II. And uh, just in that one famine in Bengal, three million people died. Uh, these things are hard to forget. Okay. Even this even inspired some people in the UK to criticize uh, Indian, or British policy in India, right? Edmund Burke right, wrote that we are like a pack of vultures. Just pick the body clean and leave the bones. The UK leaves nothing behind, unlike the rest of India's previous empires, which had actually put resources back into India. But a lot of this can be explained through the racism of the age, right? Most people in Britain were not as sympathetic to India as Edmund Burke was um, because of the racism of the time, right? The dominant ideas about race, they assured the British people, they assured the Europeans in general that empire was not only right, but just and natural. It was their destiny. One of the great writers of, of uh, this era of, of uh, British literature, and a great famous educator is named Thomas Babington Macaulay. Um, some of you will have run across him probably in grade school, you know, the lays of ancient Rome and, and so on. Um, anyway, he said that one shelf of English literature is worth the entirety of Indian civilization. And I mean, that's a very powerful way to sum up the British bias towards India. One shelf of English literature, the entirety of Indian civilization. The British left their mark on India. And as you travel around, like you're in, in, in Kolkata or Calcutta, you can see the Victoria Memorial. Right? And again, they've incorporated some things from, from Indian history and art and architecture, like the use of the reflecting pool, certainly. But uh, yeah, it's a very European style of art and architecture. One of the people in my, one of my colleagues in the India program referred to this as the we're here to stay look. Right, in, in British architecture. A lot of their you know, buildings have that similar dominant you know, uh, stretch across the line. When it comes to modern India, and see, I lied. I can't do all of Indian history in one slide. <laughs> so uh, forgive me. Uh, but modern Indian history is, 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 is its own bag. Okay? In the early 1900s, the British decided that they needed to move the capital of their Indian colony from Calcutta to New Delhi. And that would be inaugurated in 1911. Uh, the reasons for the relocation of the, the colonial capital, it's because Bengal, right, where all the, 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 the famines were, were taking place and where the, the traditional seat of British power was located, uh, where Kolkata is um, generally, is, uh, became a hotbed of Indian nationalism. You know, there were lots of people in, 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 in that region who wanted to resist British domination. And so getting out right, to a more secure lo location you know, in the center of the colony seemed wise. Also, as you can see in the, uh, the period sketches, as they designed New Delhi, there was always an old Delhi, but now there's a new Delhi uh, designed by the British, and they designed it with security in mind. I mean, the layout of New Delhi is, is, new Delhi is intensely security driven. And uh, I dropped my pointer. When you look at the sketch of New Delhi, shucks, you can see that it's designed with these very broad avenues. That's to make it hard for the people when they rise up to build barricades and seize control of pockets of the city. Okay. There's also these massive traffic circles stationed throughout New Delhi. And that's so that you can strategically place units of British soldiers and in, in artillery in a traffic circle. And it's sort of a panopticon effect. Right? If they're stationed in the traffic circle, they can just turn and they look down these broad avenues and they can essentially see what's happening in vast territories of the city. They stole this from the French. Okay, the French during the era in Paris, during the era of Napoleon III, right, were, were, were trying to prevent revolution and trying to control the population. And they used similar civic planning to, to keep the people from a successful revolution. 
So yeah, it's very much designed with security in mind. The 20th century brings great change to India, though. During World War I, 1.5 million Indians fought in World War I. They served all over the world. They experienced 65,000 you know, plus casualties. And a lot of people believe that by giving service to the empire in the war, in its moment of need, that after World War I was over, that the people of India, it would be harder for the British to deny them their, their, their rights and a degree of equality and respect. They expected a boon. They expected change after the war. But they got the opposite. Okay? Britain ended up, after World War I, enormously indebted. And they needed to squeeze their colonies, including India, harder than ever before. The people of India responded with uh, protests. And in one protest at a place called Amritsar in eastern India, um, excuse me, in, in, in western India, um, the British military conducted a massacre of people pro protesting. And, and people of India did not have the right to assemble. And they fired into the crowd. And uh, they killed somewhere between 370 and 1,000 people, unarmed protesters. Uh, we'll never know exactly how many people were murdered at Amritsar that day. Um, but that radicalized the moderates in India. I mean, when, when, the, when the government is going to start just firing into crowds, I mean, that's really going to, to start to galvanize more support. So in the aftermath of the Great War, you had the massacre at Amritsar, and then you had a very exciting time globally. You know, in the aftermath of World War I, you had the Russian Revolution, tearing down monarchy, bringing change, new, new philosophies of economics. You had the American president, the United States rises to global power, World War I, and Woodrow Wilson is talking about self-determination and the right of all peoples right, to, to, to be free. That's exciting. The Irish got independence. British, you know, arguably Britain's oldest and, and most depressed colony. Uh, the Irish finally you know, rose up in a successful war of independence and got it. Most of Ireland got it, right? Uh, Northern Ireland didn't get it, but, but uh, they got a form of independence in Ireland. There were other uprisings in Iraq and in Egypt. Okay? And many people in India started to look at the British Empire as though it were a dying beast. Inspired by the horrors of Amritsar, one of the great leaders of, of uh, 20th century India, who's Mohandas K. Gandhi, uh, began what he called the non-cooperation movement. Okay. Gandhi, of course, is famous around the world for his uh, pushing for equality and respect, but also for nonviolent resistance tactics. Right? You never rec recommended passive anything. It was a nonviolent resistance with an emphasis on resistance. Um, the non-cooperation movement meant that the people of India should boycott the system. They should you know, boycott the courts. You know, the, the, if government workers in India should leave their jobs, right? title holders should renounce their knighthoods. He asked the people not to take part in any kind of local election and boycott foreign cloth from England. Right? So when you see the famous images of Gandhi, you know, I mean, Gandhi was a lawyer. I mean, he was educated in the West. He, you know, as a younger man, he wore three-piece suits. But uh, in this phase, you know, he's famous for being photographed wearing very little. Why? Because he made it himself as an act of defiance. You know, to, to, the, to the government that said you can only buy cloth manufactured in England or Scotland, right? No, I mean, he, you know, this is, the spinning wheel becomes a symbol. You even saw it on the early Indian National Congress flag. The spinning wheel is a symbol of the people's defiance. And everyone, right, it can become part of this movement. You know, across religious lines, across ethnic lines, right, this becomes the people's movement. They go on to continue the push to, 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 to make, make change. And, and you see the, the civil disobedience movement in the early 30s. Violate unjust laws, fill the jails if necessary, put financial pressure on your oppressor. Okay, the famous example of this is the salt tax, where instead of buying you know, British salt, which is taxed, right, you can go and use ancient techniques to make your own salt. And there's a march. right? Gandhi begins in one. A uh, small town in India, and there's a there's a long march to the sea. It isn't just Gandhi, of course. That it's it's uh, thousands of other people, and the the act of making your own salt is very symbolic. You know, in India, salt is very important. 
you know, for the body, right, in that hot climate, but also to preserve food. And it's a staple, right? So, so defying the salt tax was a very evocative thing for people, you know, again, regardless of what religion you are, what ethnicity you are, what social class you are. Um, salt is evocative. Salt, onion, bread, maybe a chili. I mean, that was the staple diet for many people. It is today, too. So the British government, right here in the Great Depression, is coming under stress. And in 1931, they actually have to give up a degree of autonomy to some of their colonies. They do it first to Australia and New Zealand and Canada. They allow them to do more self-governing. They did it first for their white colonies. But many people in India wanted that, too. They wanted more independence. And more radical people in India wanted total separation from the British Empire. They wanted what most of Ireland had gotten and what the Americans had gotten even earlier. They wanted independence and republics. So as the Great Depression set in, and the US and the UK experienced bread lines, you know, the USSR was becoming a massive power, Japan too, a weakened UK had little choice but to relent and starts to, to, to let the Indians you know, get more autonomy. In 35, they got the, the Government of India Act. And they devolved some power from London. They allowed the people of India to have local elections and to, to make some decisions to govern India locally. But by now, for a lot of people in India, that was not enough. Also, a lot of people in India believe that London does not have the right to devolve power to us. Who are they to devolve power? We are the people of India. You know, so we don't accept the, the, the premise of them giving us local power. We want total independence. The final push comes in 42. Gandhi, once again from prison, says it's time to do or die, right? Meaning, let's make it complete, you know, the Quit India movement. Um, and in my opinion, the Quit India movement puts a lot of pressure on the British for their departure. It generates enormous public pressure, and the British could no longer control the timetable. Um, they hold out only a few more years after that. Their empire is going to be in free fall after World War II, especially after they lose India in 47. As Britain withdraws from India, they actually partition it. Okay? They divide the Indian colony into India and Pakistan. Pakistan was ostensibly created as a security zone for Indian Muslims. But it's also been argued that the British did this in order to, to weaken the new India and to sow discord amongst people in India and sort of uh, tell the people of South Asia that they're different based on religion and thus would allow them to be more easily manipulated by the British Empire post-independence. Gandhi used the Irish as a cautionary tale. He said, look, you know, the Irish, they used violence, but they got what they wanted, but at great cost. They got a divided island, deep social and sectarian divisions, and a legacy of unending cyclical community violence. And he said that could happen to us and how right he was, you know, because essentially the British did to South Asia what they did in that little island of Ire. You know, they divided it you know, between India and Pakistan. Gandhi, of course, and many others opposed partition of South Asia. Uh, but they were overruled by others in the Indian National Congress who wanted to just get on with independence. Right? They would accept the deal in order to speed this along and occupy positions of power in the new government. One of the other great famous leaders of this era, and a very important man, is Jawaharlal Nehru. And you see him here in this image with Bapu, right, or, or, or Gandhi. And Bapu, of course, is an honorific title that people use for Gandhi. And Nehru was very different. You know, he came, from, he was from India as well, of course, but he came from a middle class background. He was a, a liberal enlightenment thinker. He was very British in his tastes and attitudes. He likes his wines and whiskeys. Uh, he has lots of friends. He grew up in a very Angloized family. He went to Cambridge. And he likes very liberal socialist ideals. Nero and Gandhi disagreed about many things throughout Nero's career. Nero, for example, had no interest in religion. You know, he was actively anti-religious. He was against all kinds of superstitions and, and envisioned a, a powerful you know, secular India in the future and an enlightenment model. Nero, when they were in prison together, Nero spun cloth in jail, you know, to keep Bapu happy. But um, 
Really, I mean, he wasn't that interested in spinning wheels. He wasn't that interested in the cow. And he didn't, you know, agree, you know, with a, with a lot of things that Gandhi advocated. You know, Gandhi has tended to romanticize and idealize rural life, you know, living, you know, in the countryside. And Nehru believed in, in, in westernization. He believed in industrialization. Gandhi rejected socialism completely. Gandhi's vision for the future after independence was an idea of trusteeship in which the rich would take care of the poor. Uh, Gandhi believed that capitalists would eventually become the trustees and uh, they would take care of the workers and the peasants. He was against, Gandhi was against any movement against the landlords and uh, Nero disagreed. Right? Nero wanted socialist reforms. He wanted to redistribute wealth and privilege. Um, Nero was a believer in the successes of the, the Soviet Union. Uh, he believed in socialism. He believed the changes that socialism could bring for India. He wanted to end landlordism. So their differences were pretty profound. Uh, nevertheless, Gandhi eventually announced that Nehru would be his political heir. Why? Because Nero had the ability to lead in ways that Gandhi did not. Nero had, uh, he was a man who could keep the Indian National Congress together. You know, he was educated, he was liberal, he was passionate, he was principled, he was committed to the party program. Uh, he had great charisma, he was very energetic. So Gandhi also had to eventually admit that Nehru had the pulse of the people, more than Gandhi did. They both wanted the British out, but when it came to the future of India, Nehru, his message was what the people wanted to hear. Nehru, for his part, he disagreed with Gandhi, but he still loved him very much. There is an interesting and, and iconic relationship in the history of India and in Indian culture today. I mean, that famous photograph of them together, right? you can see it in a variety of different medias. Um, Nero sometimes was frustrated with Gandhi. He occasionally was angry with Gandhi. But in the end, he always came back to Bapu, says M.J. Akbar, you know, one of the great historians on this topic that I was able to meet while in India. Um, and they were united, at least in the vision of a, of a multicultural and independent India. For the most part, they worked together to get it. But since independence in 47, it was Nero's vision of India that has been advanced. Gandhi's vision of India, right, India has largely forgotten Gandhi. There are obligatory ritualistic observances for Gandhi on things like his birthday and the date of his assassination on January 30. And there are monuments to him galore. But when it comes to the actual uh, identity of India and in in the, in its Nero, Right, who was the more powerful force there. Nero would be you know, president and prime minister uh, into the 1960s uh, and had a, had a long period to, to influence the, the young republic. So modern India, it's a land of contradictions. And when it was born in 47, of course, Nero was the first prime minister. He proclaimed a tryst with destiny, a moment which comes but rarely in history when we pass from the old to the new and when, age en and, and when an age ends and when the soul of a nation long suppressed finds utterance. When the soul of a nation long suppressed finds utterance, finds voice. With those words, he launches India in 47. It's a remarkable experiment in governance. It's remarkable that it was happening at all. Um, this quote sums up a lot of you know, people's skepticism about an Indian political experiment. Churchill. The, the famous British prime minister, wrote that, writes that uh, India is merely a geographical expression. It is no more a single country than is the equator. And uh, it must be said, Winston Churchill was rarely right about India, okay, <laughs> or Ireland, or a lot of things for that matter. Um, but it is true that no other country embraces the extraordinary mixture of ethnic groups, the profusion of, of mutually incomprehensible languages, uh, the variety of topography, the variety of climates that you find in India, the diversity of religious and cultural practices, the vast range in terms of uh, economic development across the social spectrum. India is nothing but diversity. So just thinking about India makes clear the, the immensity of the challenge. Now that they have a new country in 47, 
right? And you have a you have a leader like Nero with a vision. How can they do that, right? What is, how can they define what it means to be Indian? You know, India is so big. I mean, it has you know vast snowy peaks and it has subtropical jungles. You know, there are 23, according to the the rupee note, there are 23 languages in India, and there's 22,000 dialects. In those 22,000 dialects, including some of those dialects, are spoken by more people than is Danish or Norwegian. You know, I mean, this is a huge population of people. Um, there's over a billion individuals in India. And they're of every ethnic extraction known to humanity there. So how do you come to terms with this? Right? You have a country whose population, even today, is 30% illiterate. But India also has educated the world's second largest pool of trained scientists and engineers. So I mean, it's, it's, there's an enormous range. There's an enormous difference. You know, 30% illiteracy, but also the world's second largest pool of scientists and engineers. In cities in India, they seem to overflow right, uh, with, with people, massive cities. At the same time, two out of three Indians you know, live a rural existence. You know, the majority of the population is rural, but the cities are enormous and they're overflowing. Well, in India, I had the opportunity to, to meet this man, Sashi Tharoor. It's a, a real treat. He's a member of parliament in India. And he's also you know, a noted author. And he's phrased this question that I've been wrestling with. He's phrased it very eloquently. He says, how does one explain a land where peasant organizations and suspicious officials once attempted to close down Kentucky Fried Chicken as a threat to the nation? Where a former prime minister once bitterly criticized the sale of Coca-Cola in a country where villagers don't have clean drinking water? And which yet invents more sophisticated software for the planet's computer manufacturers than any other country in the world? How can one determine the future of an ageless civilization that was the birthplace of four major religions, a dozen different traditions of classical dance, 85 major political parties, and 300 ways of cooking the potato? The short answer is that it cannot be done, at least not to everyone's satisfaction. Any truism about India can be immediately contradicted by another truism about India. He goes on, it is often jokingly said that anything you can say about India, the opposite is also true. The country's National motto emblazoned on its governmental crest is Satyamiva Jayati, meaning truth alone triumphs. But for the historian, you have to ask whose truth? You know? Sashi Thoreau you know, says that's, that's a question to which there are a one, there's about one billion valid answers to that question uh, based on the population of India. Uh, but also, you know, he admits that. You know, that's not really an answer at all, and so we have to find another answer. Okay. The only thing you can really do with India is to think of India in the plural. You can't talk about India. You can only talk about the Indias. And that's, that's a hackneyed phrase. You must think about Indias. Uh, but in India, everything exists in countless variants. Pluralism is acknowledged in every aspect of Indian society. For example, after, when it was a young country, at that time, when the, when the empires are, 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 are devolving and the empires are collapsing, a lot of places in our world, now that they got independence, they experienced with authoritarian government to try to jumpstart the process of, of uh, creating jobs and creating infrastructure. India didn't go that route. They immediately opted for a multi-party democracy. And since that happened in 47, I mean, yes, it's come under many strains and many stresses including 22 months you know, in, in, in where they had autocratic rule during the emergency in 75. But uh, yeah, it's a multi-party democracy. It's freewheeling. It's, it's robust. It's sometimes corrupt. It's inefficient sometimes. It's, it's still, nonetheless, it's flourishing. Um, but the question remains, who's truth? You know, it, um, India strikes many people when they first get there as, as maddening, as chaotic, uh, as inefficient, and seemingly unpurposeful. It takes some getting used to. You know? It muddles its way through here in the second decade of the 21st century. Um, to look at it in a more positive light, think of India not just as a country, think of it as an adventure, where there's an enormous amount of avenues open to it in the future, and everything is possible. The great British historian, 
E.P. Thompson once wrote that India is perhaps the most important country for the future of our world. All the convergent influences of the world run through this society. There is not a thought that is being thought in the West or East that is not active in some Indian mind. The Indian mind. Whose truth? The Indian mind. It's something that has been shaped by ancient Hindu tradition, by myth and scripture and faith. It's been impacted by Christianity and Islam, by two centuries of British colonial rule. And the result is unique. The result is, of course, a pluralist state. You know, where, where diversity is the only real central characteristic. It could hardly have survived as anything but a pluralist state. The very nature of their country demands it. Anyway, when it comes to Indian nationalism, it's hard to understand. I think it's helpful first to stress what it is not based on before we can look at what it actually is based on. Let me give you some examples. For example, Indian nationalism, it's not based on, on race. You know, historically, Indian society had been segmented into hierarchical categories known as Varna. And this can be traced all the way back to the Vedic age, you know, in, in that conflict between the lighter skinned Aryas and the comparatively darker skinned Dasas. Um, the Rig Veda tells us about these classes. The Aryans were the conquerors, and the Dasas are there to serve them. Um, Varna appears to have emerged from that dynamic. And the lower orders of Varna, right in this class hierarchy, tend to have darker skin. And not always, but, but often. And in the modern period, you know, the British, of course, brought their racism, the, the racism of empire to India. And that only served to institutionalize and intensify pre-existing differences along skin color lines. You know, the British would privilege people with fairer skin or people who they thought had more European features, got better treatment. They enjoyed more privilege. They were more up upwardly mobile in the social spectrum in the period of the Raj. So as a result, the idea of lighter skin in India has remained a, an ideal of beauty. And you can see this, for example, even today, one thing that surprised me very much was all the advertisements that I saw in India for fairness creams. And you see this advertised on television and on the radio and in the newspapers and on billboards. Right? Fairness creams, right, where, well, there's all kinds of different products, right, that are, that are designed for this. But fair skin in four weeks, right? Garnier, right? Lots of different products. Um, the most common one is fair and lovely. But there's uh, Fair Ever, you know, they're, they're, and, and uh, there's lots of different products. And they're marketed to both men and women. Um, most of them historically were marketed to, to, to women. And, and there's a the majority of the advertisements depict a, a woman with comparatively darker skin. And she's got a problem, or at least in the, in the commercial, right? The problem is, is that she's too dark skinned. And thus, she's not going to be chosen for you know, the marriage that she wants or the job that she wants. And the solution to her problem, as the commercial would have you believe, is to buy the skin lightening product. Okay? A lot of these, the, there's different ingredients. But what they do is they suppress the development of melanin in human skin. Um, so yeah, some of them are marketed to women. Others, of course, are marketed you know, by, by celebrities, of course, of all kinds. Um, but for men, too. You know, there's fairness creams, you know, by Garnier. There's, again, Bollywood celebrities, right? Use fair and handsome, like me. Because uh, that's what, you know, the, the ideal of manliness. You know, these kinds of things appear in, in many forms of media in India. So, I mean, India is diverse, and there is still a bias according to, you know, racial or skin color appearance. By fair and lovely, so that your skin tone can be lightened and you can enjoy the privileges associated with that lighter skin. You see it in media, too. You know, it's hard to escape this kind of bias. Uh, you see it in television. You know, most, act, most of the most famous actors and actresses in India tend to be comparatively lighter skinned. 
I took this image, this picture of a, of a billboard that we constantly saw when we were there in July of 2013. And this is a show that was real big in India, and it's about to come back on for its next season on July 8th at 10.30 PM. This billboard, billboard was everywhere. Um, I never got to see the show. I don't know what it's about. I assume it's about an attractive young Indian policewoman who fights crime and shoots two guns in different directions simultaneously. Uh, and, and, and who wouldn't want to watch that show? I mean, that sounds great. Um, but you know, the most famous actors and actresses tend to have comparatively lighter skin. I was able to go to the movies one night. And uh, I saw on its opening night you know, this, this big new Bollywood release called Barg Milka Barg, which translates roughly to Run Milka Run. And this was a blast. You know, I, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed this. I didn't understand a word of the dialogue. Um, there's no subtitles or anything. But you go in with the crowd. You know, some of us went together. It was monsoon. It was raining. So we go through a flooded city in a tuk-tuk. And uh, we get into the movie. And you sit down. You got your nachos. It feels kind of like home. Uh, and then the movie starts. And, and uh, these big Bollywood pictures are so much fun uh, because they have to have everything. You know, it's, it's about a, an Indian Olympian named Milka Singh. Um, but of course, it's got to have it all. It's, it's got to be a musical, obviously, with dance numbers. So occasionally, you know, he's in the army and he's training, and then the characters break into song and dance. Uh, but it also has to be a love story, and it's got to be an action story, and it's got to be about fathers and sons, and it's got to be about patriotism, and it has to have everything all in it. You know, so it is a riot. It's like six hours long. Um, it's like three hours long, but it, it's a long movie. There's actually an intermission, like we used to have you know, in Western movies. When we were at the theater, fortunately, I sat next to one of my colleagues in Harjan, uh, who was one of the US academics in the program. But he was also, uh, he, he'd spent much of his life in India. He was an Indian American who, who had visited India and grown up there. So he's bilingual. And uh, occasionally, he'd throw me a bone you know, and be like, that's his sister. They're talking about his dad. You know, and I'm like, oh, so that's why they're all crying. Uh, and, 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 you know, occasionally, but more or less from the tone and from what you see, you can kind of follow along. And it was very moving. You know, there's a scene where Milka Singh, right, he's a Sikh from the Punjab, you know, an, an ethnic and religious minority in India. Uh, but he joins the army and he learns how to run competitively and eventually he becomes an Olympian. Uh, and and uh, anyway, when he was a kid in the army, teenager, you know, 19, 20 you know, years old, there was one, he was kind of a screw up and, and one of the officers or one of the sergeants saw something in him and, and, and trained him and believed in him and gave him a jump and then he goes on and becomes all this great stuff and, the, and, and he wins this medal and he comes back to visit the old army base and everyone's looking at him like he's the big shot, right, Milk is saying and, and uh, he's humbled by that but there's a scene and again, I don't understand a word of this, but he walks up to this sergeant who believed in him and trained him. He takes the medal off his neck and he puts it on the old man's neck. And oh my God, it got me. You know, it, it really did. Uh, so anyway, the movies are fun. But again, most of the characters you see in the movies have comparatively lighter skin. Right? They feature lighter skinned actors and actresses. Shucks. I broke your mic. They feature lighter skinned actors and actresses. But the overall themes of the movie, Barg Milka Barg, were nationalism, unity, respect for diversity. You know, he's, a, he's an ethnic you know, and religious minority, but he comes to represent India in the Olympic Games and the Commonwealth Games. It's a true story, uh, so it was very popular. Um, so anyway, yeah, race doesn't make up the Indian identity. Ethnicity, likewise, you know, it further complicates the idea of majority community. Right? When Indians introduce themselves, their names often tell you where they're from. Okay? And you know, most Indian, there's intermarriage between you know groups in the cities, but most of India remains largely endogamous. Right? They tend to marry within you know their social groups. Um, and you can tell ethnicity in a variety of ways. Like for example. Uh, I, I don't, because I'm a foreigner, I don't have an eye for this, but you know, one of the directors of our program named Mina, Mina Hayek, uh, she, could, she told us that by the way that women use the sari, by the, by the, by the style of the drape and the, the nature of the cloth, that speaks to their ethnic identity. And uh, for, for many people in India, you just have to look at how someone is, is, is wearing the sari, right? and that tells you what part of Indian culture they're from. You know, I mean, that ethnicity you know, leaps out in, in fashion and in modes of, of presentation and dress. 
Most men prefer Western clothing, but women have maintained the sari uh, in most cases. Even the stewardesses on Air India you know, wear saris. Um, so anyway, nationalism is not based on ethnicity. It accommodates, ethnic, or nationalism in India accommodates every kind of ethnic identity. Um, you know, racially or ethnically, you know, if you're from the Punjab, you might have more in common with people in Pakistan than with people, you know, from parts of southern India. Right? Or if you're from Bihar, right, you might have more in common with people from Bangladesh, you know, racially and ethnically than you do with people in India. But you're still Indian, because the idea of Indianness, the idea of the Indian national identity is bigger than all that. Language as well. You know, the Constitution of India recognizes tw 23 languages, but actually I've read that there's 35 languages. And within those languages, um, there's 22,000 dialects. And so yeah, I mean, everyone's a linguistic minority in India. You know, there is no majority, you know, uh, identity. Hindi is probably the most broadly spoken you know, language, and, and, uh, but still, that's about half the population right, can speak and at least get by in Hindi. Uh, but in no sense is Hindi the language of the majority. Um, to a lot of people in India in the south and in the, in the northeast, the basic rules of it, and they might have some Hindi vocabulary, but like the basic rules about its gender and its locutions and, and its, its, you know, the basic you know, script is, is going to be foreign. Likewise, when it comes to religion, religion is also not a foundation for the national identity. India is a civilization that over millennia has offered refuge and, and religious and cultural freedom to pretty much every religion on the planet, except maybe Shintoism, you know, which is native to Japan mostly. But pretty much every other religion is there. You know, for example, there have been Jewish people in India. Uh, they came to Kerala centuries before the birth of Christ, after the Babylonians destroyed you know, one of the first temples. And they knew no, no persecution on Indian soil until the, the, the 16th century when the Portuguese showed up to inflict it. Okay, I mean, Jewish people in India were unpersecuted. Likewise, Christianity is ancient in India. I mean, Christianity arrived in India uh, before the year 52 AD with Thomas, uh, St. Thomas, the apostle, Doubting Thomas, uh, shows up in India. He's, he comes to the shore there again at Kerala. Uh, he's welcomed to, to India. Right down the shore, there's a, according to the famous story, there's a flute-playing Jewish girl who welcomes St. Thomas to India. And he won converts. And so there, you know, the idea of this, it, it's sometimes staggering, but the, the idea is that there are Indians today whose ancestors were Christian hundreds of years before Christianity reached Europe. You know? Islam, likewise. You know, comes to, is, to India through traders, travelers, merchants, missionaries, not by the sword, usually. Um, so this is India. You know, I mean, it's not just the, you know, Buddhism and Hinduism and, and Sikhism, right, that are famously identified with India, but it really it's all religions, right? It's a land with a heritage of diversity. Hinduism, it needs to be said, is a, is a religion of diversity. I mean, in Hinduism, there's no national organization right, that regulates the re Hindu religion. There's no Hindu pope. There's no Hindu mecca. Um, there's no church or ecclesiastical hierarchy of priests in Hinduism. They're all over. Uh, it, it's a very diverse religion. It exemplifies India's diversity. A good example would be Varanasi, when I was able to travel. In Varanasi, Mark Twain went there, another American abroad, much more eloquent than I am. And Twain says that Varanasi, or Benares, the anglicized version, Benares is older than history, older than tradition, old and even, older even than legend, and looks twice as old as all of them put together. It's one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities on the planet. And it has a very unique you know, riverscape. It's on the river Ganges. And it's the holiest site in Hinduism. And again, it characterize, it's characterized by contradictions. For Hindus, Shiva is the principal deity of the city. And for Hindus, it's believed that you should go to Varanasi when you're going to die. Uh, because if you die in Varanasi, you will experience moksha. And you are liberated from the cycle of birth and rebirth. And you go to heaven. Contradictions abound in Varanasi. You know, it's, 
it's narrow streets. It looks like a, it looks like you know in, in a medieval city. A bunch of parts of it are. Um, people go there to die, but you'd think it'd be a grim or a dismal place, but it's not. Varanasi is a celebration of life. I was able to see the, the ceremonies at the ghats or temples that line the river at night as the sun goes down over Mother Ganges. And uh, you see these huge throngs of people to come out to, to worship together. And again in the morning, right, you go back and you can see the sun rise you know, over, 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 over the Ganges. And it's electric. You can see how for many people it would be a spiritual experience right, to, to be there with your family at that time, to go into the river and, and bathe in the purifying waters of the source of life. So it's an ancient Hindu city, and yet, you know, dominating over it all, right, is a great Islamic mosque, right, that was built by the Mughal emperor Aurangzeb uh, in the Mughal period. Uh, towers over the skyline. Okay. Aurangzeb was sort of an anomaly. He was not religiously tolerant. He actually tore down a Hindu temple to build his mosque. But he's the exception that proves the rule that generally India is pretty, pretty, pretty tolerant, you know, and, and inclusive. And today, the holiest city in Hinduism, Varanasi, Banaras, 20% of its population is Muslim. Social class, again, does not define the Indian national identity. Okay? Again, extreme diversity. And you can read lots of articles that read about child labor exploitation. Right, this one here is about a boy 10 years old named Amantosh, and he works in a textile, you know, sweatshop. And uh, for those of you in world history, if you were to read this, it sounds exactly like the primary sources from 19th century England. You know, I mean, it's, 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 it's shocking the ex same experiences that happened to other people in earlier periods of industrialization in other countries are going on right now in India. Students of American history who are familiar with the event called the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, factory fire in, in New York, was where a bunch of, you know, in, in the early 1800s, a lot of uh, American uh, workers were in a factory called the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. And uh, a fire broke out, and uh, the factory owners had locked the doors so that people couldn't sneak out for breaks. Um, and a lot of people perished in that fire. And last year, two years ago now, it happened again in India. Pretty much the same story, you know. Uh, it's in Bangladesh. But uh, hundreds of people, you know, I mean, estimates vary, 124, 111, probably a lot more, uh, were trapped in a building that was not adequate design for their safety, their security. And when a fire broke out, hundreds of them perished. Okay, the streets are too narrow for a fire truck to even get there. It reads just like early industrialization. So for a lot of people in India, uh, I mean, they're, 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 they're struggling. The Constitution of India promises empowerment, dignity, justice, governance. But for a lot of people in India, they're further from that than a hawk is from the moon. I mean, if, when you look at the cities, I mean, just you know, basic civil engineering and safety concerns that we take for granted here in the West, uh, you know, with the electrical wires, you know, the monkeys use them to get around. But other than that, it's not really a healthy or safe environment. Uh, you can see overcrowding. You can see, you know, pits in the streets and, and, and just a lack of public safety. A lot of people just lack opportunity. Uh, it's getting better, but excruciatingly slowly for a vast majority of their one billion population. Poverty is all too common. Things often move very slowly in the countryside, even slower than in the cities. So. Things that are promised by the Constitution have not yet been delivered for many. And yet Indian nationalism survives. Back to the main question then. If it's not based on language, or geography, or ethnicity, or religion, or social class, you know, what is Indian nationalism? It's the nationalism, says Sashi Tharoor, of, of an idea Okay, it's the nationalism of an idea, of an ever, ever land, emerging from an ancient civilization, united by a shared history, sustained by a pluralist democracy. It's the idea that the nation can endure differences in caste and creed and color and cuisine and still survive, right? Because of a, a uniquely Indian concept of consensus. 
Consensus in India is, is the belief right, that in a democracy, you don't really need to agree. You just need to agree on the ground rules of how you will disagree. And, and that is a huge part of the Indian consciousness. A reason India has survived all the stresses and strains that it's experienced for 75 years since its independence uh, and led so many observers to declare that it was about to collapse is that it has that concept of consensus. Right? There is, in India, there is consensus on how to manage without consensus. And that's really impressive. You know, a lot of democracies want that and, and often come up short. Secularism in India does not mean anti-religiousness. It means all religions. You know, and they're very serious about that. And, and when you're in India, you can see Zoroastrian temples and you can see Sikh temples and you know, Christian churches and, and mosques and, and Hindu and Buddhist and Jain temples. And, and, and uh, they all exist in the same neighborhood. You know, and it's not, there's not a dominant religion in most places. Even devoutedly you know, anti-religious parties, like for example, the communist parties in India, uh, their voters don't want to talk about anti-religion. Right? So they've adapted to that. And even communist parties in pockets of India, they participate in religious ceremonies. And, and uh, during the, the, the seasonal holiday, the Durga uh, prayer, the Durga puja, everyone makes these big floats. And the communist parties do it as well. They sort of compete with lavishness and beauty uh, for, their for, their, for their floats in India in celebration of the goddess Durga. So. India is plural, right? It is not really secular, but it is so secular that it is all religions. And it is a source of identity and pride. Okay. Since its independence, there have been 13 presidents in India, but three of them have been Muslims. Right. The second to last one was Sikh. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very religiously diverse country, more so than any other country that I can really think of. Um, there are challenges to this diversity. For example, there, are, there is extremism. Right? There are Hindu extremists in India who believe that you know, India should become a Hindu uh, rashtra, right? meaning a, a safe haven for, for Hindus. And they believe that you know, Muslims should be purged from India, for example. And they made gains you know, in the 1990s. You know, their, their, their numbers in government swole, their politics in the street became more active. Okay. And in recent years, there have been horrible setbacks and tragedies. For example, right, the Babri Masjid, or the Babri Mosque in, in, in India, uh, is something that was built during the, the, the early, 1600, early 16th century, early 1500s. Beautiful example of that era right, of Islamic dome and architecture and, and mosque construction. And in 1992, one of these mobs of Hindu fanatics destroyed it. And it touched off riots throughout India. And people lost their lives. It was ugly. It was sad. But the majority said that it was not Indian, you know, that it was against the national character. It was against what Gandhi and Nehru had wanted, a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, inclusive idea of Indianness. But it doesn't go away. That challenge survives. The real open wound in India, even today, is what happened in 2002 in a, region, in a city in a region called Gujarat. And it turned into riots. And some would even go so far as to call it a pogrom, right? where in some areas of Gujarat, uh, Hindus attacked Muslim communities and butchered them. There were rapes. There were murders. You know, thousands of people lost their lives in 2002. Not just in Gujarat, but it touched off conflict, intercommunal inter violence elsewhere in India. So given India's long history, uh, when headlines talk about riots and, and violence and Hindu against Muslim, people being slaughtered because of a mark on their head or the lack of a foreskin, uh, it's tragic. Right, because of the loss of life and also because India it survived Aryas and Mughals and the British. And it's taken from each in language and in art and in thought and in cuisine. And it's grown with all of that. And it's supposed to be a, a, an inclusive dream. But it is threatened right, by extremism and by uh, people who believe that there's only one way to be Indian. Causation for this, right, these images are, are horrific you know, from, the, from the Gujarat case. 
There have been other intercommunal riots. I mean, there was a bomb that went off when I was there last summer. You know, I mean, nothing like Gujarat in 2002. But it does occasionally rear its head. Okay. Some would argue that the, the politics of deprivation, that there's simply too many people, not enough resources, not enough jobs, and that poverty accentuates social tension. Gandhi argued that poverty is the greatest violence. Right? Poverty hurts the deepest and the longest. You know? And that competition you know, breeds this kind of anger and frustration, and it pours out through sectarian violence. Also, there's some politicians in India who sadly want to mobilize voters by appealing not to the idea of Indianness, but to more narrow identities. All right, I'll go out of a politician and I'll tell them that they should vote for me because we're all Hindu or we're all Muslims and we should form one party for us and not India as a large. And again, that's a threat. It's dangerous. The Indian army regularly, you know, when you read the papers, you know, the Indian army bleeds on a regular basis in its conflict with various extremist groups. You know, there's Maoists and there's Hindu extremists and there's Muslim extremists. And usually these stories are buried on page eight of the Times of India, but you know, three dead, five dead. You know, it's, it's happening. But there's hope too. India long ago reconciled the concept of diversity with its nationalism. And it has had great leaders right, that have embedded that in the consciousness of multiple generations now. And there are contemporary challenges to that concept of Indian national identity and oneness. Okay, there are historic and contemporary challenges. But so far, it's holding. Right? The Indian experiment in nation building remains democratic. It remains focused on pluralism. And it's sustained by this idea of a larger India that is not based on race and that is not based on you know, language or anything like that. And that gives me hope, too, because when I look in American society, and I, again, I turn on the TV and I hear you know, Republican Congress people talking about how you know, the rising population of Americans who speak Spanish is going to tear apart the social fabric of our society and destroy the republic. I think not, because I've been to India. You know, uh, religious diversity scares people as well, and some people see it as, as, the, as the sky falling and the end of America is written with religious diversity because we're not going to be a Christian country anymore. I think not. I think that the idea of a nation and a people's commitment to democracy and to pluralism and to equality can be a great uniting factor. Right? All we really need is a consensus on how to manage things, a consensus on how to manage without consensus. So India is an inspiration in that way. There are challenges to its national identity, but there is hope, too. And yeah, I have a few minutes left. Anybody have any questions? We have a microphone, because it's going to be recorded. So if you have a question, I'm going to use the mic. Please raise your hand. I'll go on. Um, while you were in uh, India, how, how much of the caste system lingering did you see? Like, how prevalent is it in modern Indian society? It's there. It's, not, it's nothing like it was in, in history. In, in, white people in India are very much divided on the caste system. Because some people you know, dated all the way back to, to an ancient tradition, and some of the classic works of Hinduism talk about how you know, Vishnu's you know, head is the Brahma, and the arms are the you know, Kshatriya, and, and so on, and, and uh, it's rooted deep. Other people believe that it was invented by the British uh, to intensify social divisions, or at least the, the British took a pre-existing concept and then really institutionalized it in order to drive wedges between segments of the population to allow them to be more easily manipulated. So, Modern India is a republic. People are equal. People have rights. Gandhi said we need to purge the Varna system. We need to purge untouchability. And there has been large progress towards that. But untouchability still exists. Some people, especially in rural areas, still have that, that fate, unfortunately. It's getting better, but it's not done. People still know your, typically people will know their, their, their Varna uh, as a matter of like family history and a source of identity. But a lot of people in India today don't believe that it you know, is a hierarchy anymore. Um, though it still can be used sometimes for political uh, parties, 
right? And I'll get votes if I'm of this class and cast, and I'll go to the other cast and, and ask them to vote for me because we're all the same cast. You'll see monuments sometimes. There's a great monument. We were on the road from Delhi to Kurukshetra, and there's a monument to the Shudra, people of India, right, which historically was the lowest varna and the most persecuted. And there's this massive monument you know, of sculptures of famous Shudra people emphasizing their contributions to Indian history and culture. So it's still there, but it's not in as powerful a hierarchy as it once was. Good question. Thank you. Um, can you compare and contrast Indian's freedom with South Africa's freedom? Yeah, yeah. Uh, take me about an hour and a half to really give that full justice, but it's a valid question, and I think an important one. Uh, South Africa also experienced, you know, colonialism and, and, and colonial development, and, and uh, I mean, one of the reasons for why, you know, a lot of people believe that the British institutionalized foreigners is because of what they did in South Africa, where they drove wedges and created different ideas of race. Ideas and I race is an idea that is manipulated by governments. And so when they ruled South Africa, the British said there were white people and there were black people and then there were colored people, a third racial caste. And they told all the different castes that they had nothing in common. And that prevented the unity that people might need for rebellion, a successful rebellion. Uh, so I think there are certainly many parallels that could be drawn. Of course, Gandhi's career began in South Africa as a human rights lawyer and an advocate for equality. And what he learned in South Africa in challenging empire and inequity, he then applied to India. So there's a lot of different parallels. First of all, thank you. That was an uh, incredible uh, summary of some world history. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about modern India. As you were there, did you get to experience or interface with any of the people who are the educated class, the ones that we hear in the call centers, the ones that are so technologically advanced. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of medical tourism in India. Um, there's a lot of uh, you know, tourism that includes the temple tours, but there are also people who go there and just uh, hang out and stay for extended periods of time because of what India offers them. Did, did you get to experience that? Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's, you meet all kinds of, of folk. Uh, so a lot of the people that we met from the government, you know, were that educated elite. And we're quite honest about it. And, and they knew that, you know, privilege works in every society in different ways. But, you know, in, in the United States, I mean, there's degrees of privilege that, you know, sculpt our society. And same thing in India. And I think if anything in India, I mean, the people I met in the government and from those educated privileged classes were very much aware of their privilege. Um, and a lot of them have dedicated their lives to, to leveling that playing field, so to speak. So, yeah, in America, you know, everybody believes that they're middle class. You know, <laughs> so that's the, that's the joke. Uh, in other countries of the world, including India, people are more aware of social difference. And uh, they take, you know, a greater share of identity from their social class. And I think you can see that in India. There's a higher degree of awareness. Similar, you know, some, the other comparison and, and contrast is uh, the American concept of the melting pot, which does not exist in India, right? If, if uh, the, the analogy that I heard is that if America is a melting pot, then India is a thali, which is a traditional Indian dish. And it doesn't all mix together, but it's one plate with different little bowls, each with a different dish. And they, don't, they shouldn't be mixed together, but they all belong in the same plate. Right, and they all, so all the flavors of one little bowl dish, you know, they complement the, the flavors of the other. So a thali right, is greater than the sum of its parts, but it doesn't all mix together. Um, so that's another interesting analogy. It's not a melting pot, it's a thali. So it's a different way of looking at your nation, a different way of looking at its, at its diversity. Thank you. All right, I think we're out of time. So let's give Dr. Hendershot one more round of applause. Thank you very much.